Hello, uh, this is Dr. Arthur Lee. Uh, I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon, partner at OrthoCincy Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, why does my knee replacement hurt? Um, first of all, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, obviously, uh, I'm involved with OrthoCincy and also involved with the Christ Hospital Health Network. Um, Christ Hospital has the Joint and Spine Center, which is a a uh, fine facility that is dedicated to orthopedic surgery and spine surgery. So it's really a fantastic place to work and uh, experience a center that is devoted toward musculoskeletal medicine and musculoskeletal surgery. So um, I'm very fortunate to be involved with that. Um, I do uh, primarily uh, hip and knee replacement surgeries and uh, the joint and spine center is focused upon those procedures as well as a variety of other operations uh, uh, such as total shoulders, a spine, et cetera. So that being said, we'll move on to why does my knee replacement hurt? Um, you folks are all muted. So the way this works is that uh, as you develop questions, um, they will be answered at the end. I will walk through uh, the, out, the outline of uh, potential etiologies of uh, why my knee replacement might hurt. Some of them are, are, are straightforward. Some of them are not, but we'll kind of work our way through that and then hopefully that will generate some meaningful questions at the end. I do not have any disclosures. Um, that my only other comment in that regard would be that uh, uh, Smith & Nephew uh, Orthopedics has been kind enough to uh, supply us with the images of the knee replacements that you'll be seeing here. So thank you to Smith & Nephew for doing that. We've already talked about my affiliations, um, so we'll move forward. So basically, oftentimes people say, uh, you know, what could possibly be causing my pain in my knee replacement? Isn't it metal and plastic? Well, it's, uh, there are a lot of other components to, the, to answer the question of why would your knee replacement hurt? And we'll go through those. And of course, it's still major surgery, even though it is now oftentimes outpatient. But it's normal for a knee replacement to hurt because you know, the bones have been cut, the tissues have been cut. Um, so therefore, a, a normal knee replacement is still going to hurt for a period of time but normally it gets much better over a couple of months and you get back to a very functional level of activities. There are many possible causes for continued knee pain. Um, I'll just walk through with you the list here and then we'll go into them in much more detail. Uh, one would be infection. So a, an infection that's involving the knee prosthesis, that is actually the most serious of the potential causes. There is loosening where the uh, contact between the prosthesis uh, and your bone has failed. So knee replacements are typically cemented uh, in place. If that bone cement can fail or the bone can resorb or some other issue happens where that interface fails and that is a pain generator. The next potential etiology would be instability. So the knee replacement is dependent upon the soft tissues around it. So that would include not only the ligaments, now there's the anterior cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament, the medial collateral ligament, and the lateral collateral ligament. Those can be unstable, or you could potentially have instability because of muscular weakness. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Everyone's knee is a different size. So it's potential that uh, the knee replacement that was used in your case could be an incorrect size. It might be rubbing on tissues. It could just not interface correctly for your body, potential pain generator. The next one is hip disease. Um, the hip and the knee obviously are intimately related um, and therefore a lot of hip issues can cause knee pain and we'll get into details there. As you probably know, uh, the spine can cause leg pain as well. Uh, the nerves from the low back go into the legs. So oftentimes patients perceive thigh pain, knee pain, lower leg pain when, uh, and attribute it to their knee replacement where in actuality it may very well be their spine. Another possible etiology is vascular disease. So that's blood vessel disease, arteries, veins. They can cause pain as well and cause what's called claudication. So uh, you may note some burning pain, other types of discomfort because there's poor blood supply. And again, we'll go into more detail on that. More potential causes would be muscles. Are you deconditioned? You, uh, the, the knee requires that you have good strength of your hamstrings and particularly good strength of your quadriceps. 
You could have some sort of tendon inflammation. Just because you have a knee replacement, you still have something such as the iliotibial band that the runners would get. You could have patellar tendonitis, the tendon below your kneecap, et cetera. There are superficial nerves that are around your knee, and those can be irritated. Then the last two, one is something called causalgia, or uh, it used to be known as a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, kind of an a, a incorrect setting of your sympathetic nervous system where you've had some sort of uh, a trauma to the body that could be fracture, it could be surgery as, a, as the case for knee replacement, and the body basically resets your, your pain sensors to too high a level, and that can cause pain. And then finally, there's this tiny group of people where you can't find any reason why it hurts. It may possibly be because they're allergic to the metal, but it's just frankly, uh, occasionally, rarely a situation where you can't find uh, the reason. So what, what do we have to do? We have to define the enemy. So the patient comes into the office and says, my knee replacement hurts me. You have to take a history. So you know, when does it hurt? When did it start? Has it always hurt since the surgery? Uh, do medicines help? Do, does activity increase it? So gathering data from a historical perspective. Then of course you do the physical examination. So here we're looking at, does the knee move? Is it stable? Does, is the kneecap tracking correctly? Uh, is there other apps, uh, aspects to uh, how the ankle moves, how the hip moves, uh, the health of the spine? All those factors are looked at. Then of course you do x-rays. So you're looking at the knee replacement and say, does it look appropriately positioned? Is it the right size? Is it loose? Is it a type of a knee replacement that requires certain ligaments to function well to, to give the patient a good stable knee? Then we get into a situation where you say we need more data. So there are some blood tests and they're really focused upon is the knee replacement infected? So everyone always thinks of this, you know, the, 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 the white blood count, that's gonna tell me whether I have an infection or not. In actuality, in orthopedics, that's the least important of the three. We do get that data with the complete blood count, the so-called CBC, but we're looking at the white blood count. The other important factors are the SED rate, which is known as the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. What that tells us is, is there abnormal inflammation in the body? So that's one other piece of data as in case it's infected or loose. And then the last most more important factor is something called the C-reactive protein. The C-reactive protein blood test tells us is if there is an infection in the body and that protein responds to an infection. So that gives us some real hard data and probably the most important of those three blood tests. The next piece of information is uh, advanced x-ray. Uh, so we're talking about MRI scan, a bone scan, and then uh, another test called an EMG. The MRI scan, of course, is the computerized uh, test around the knee that can look at the soft tissues around the tissue. There are high uh, highly sophisticated techniques where you can subtract out the metal to look at other structures around the knee. The bone scan is a very specific test uh, and it's looking at is there abnormal uptake around your knee replacement? So if the knee replacement is infected, if the knee replacement is loose, if it is unstable, you may see increased uptake on the bone scan. So it's a test where uh, a medication's injected into your body and goes to areas where bone is active. The last test, the EMG test, is not an x-ray test. It's another type of study uh, where you're looking at the function of the nerves, really looking at does the patient have some sort of low back issue or neurologic issue that might be causing their pain, either from a nerve around the knee, such as the perineal nerve, or nerves from the low back, like a herniated disc type of issue. More testing that can be done is the examination under anesthesia. So you can take the patient to the operating room, put them to sleep and see with them not giving you any pain, uh, uh, protection, if you will, from pain, you can see if the ligaments are working correctly, range of motion is, is what you perceived it to be in the office, those sorts of things. And then ultimately, if you need more data, you can actually uh, biopsy the tissue, which is obviously a, a procedure as well. And then you can send that tissue off for further studies, again, particularly looking for uh, the possibility of an infection. So what are we hoping for? Well, we're hoping for this type of issue. We're hoping for a tendonitis, an inflamed tendon, like, a, like, like the, the, uh, the tendon below your kneecap, the patellar tendon. Bursitis, uh, the fluid over your, your, your kneecap or uh, some uh, inflammation around the side of your knee uh, where these soft tissues are. You may have uh, pain in your knee replacement because your quadriceps isn't strong. 
you know, straightforward, treatable issue, or you may have a mild ligament sprain. Just because you have a knee replacement doesn't mean that the ligaments don't have to work. You can still, you know, if you miss a step, fall down the stairs, you can, you can pull the ligaments or hurt the ligaments. So these types of conditions are treated in a very straightforward fashion. non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, a brace, temporarily limiting your activities, perhaps a soft tissue injection, things you might expect in, in more of a sports medicine world where, hey, I overdid it, my knee's inflamed, but the knee replacement itself is good. So th that's what we're, we're hoping for because these are very straightforward and easy things to treat. So I wanna talk a little bit more about hip arthritis. Obviously folks that have knee arthritis that need knee replacements oftentimes have hip arthritis. Well, hip arthritis uh, causes groin pain, it causes your thigh to ache, and it causes a decrease in range of motion of your hip. If your hip doesn't move well, particularly in the rotational abilities of the hip, it can cause knee pain. So sometimes you'll see someone with a knee replacement, they can say, well, my knee replacement hurts, but in actuality, they have bad hip arthritis, their hip is stiff and is putting extra stress on their knee. Another potential hip etiology is greater trochanteric bursitis. That's that uh, bursal sac that's over the bump on the side of your hip. So if you put your hand on the side of your hip, you feel a little prominence, the greater tuberosity, excuse me, greater trochanter, that can be inflamed and that can be treated with uh, uh, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, or potential uh, a shot. And then lastly, there's also hip flexor tendonitis. There's a big flexor tendons that are run to, uh, to bend your hip up into flexion, those can be inflamed and can cause the perception of, of thigh and knee pain as well. Of course, the spine uh, can cause discomfort. Uh, the low back uh, uh, nerves go to the lower extremities, including the knee. So you always have to make sure when you're talking with the patient, examining the patient, is the pain potentially coming from their low back with actually more of a radiating pain and perhaps numbness and tingling uh, uh, down the leg. Obviously, numbness and tingling can only come from a nerve. Uh, the knee itself can't generate those symptoms. If that nerve signal isn't correct to your, to your leg, you may have a giving way sensation. So while my knee, my knee replacement is giving out on me, or in actuality, what that may mean is the nerves that are going to your thigh are not correctly giving input to the muscles, and that's why it's giving out. This, of course, can cause weakness and as well as uh, balance issues. So you have to carefully, always carefully look at the spine. Vascular disease, obviously the blood vessels go all the way down to the tips of your toes. It can cause all sorts of issues involved in the lower extremities. And again, as we get older, the folks that typically need a knee replacement, you can have vascular disease. So swelling of the leg, discoloration of the skin, particularly in that area on the inside, uh, just above your uh, ankle area. A burning sensation below the knee is often seen with vascular disease, perception of weakness, uh, lack of endurance. Say, so, well, you know, I, 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 can, I can walk for five or 10 minutes and then my, my knee gets tired and I have to sit down. In actuality, it's, it's poor blood supply. Uh, if the blood supply is particularly uh, bad, then you may actually see ulcerations or wounds that don't want to heal and involving your lower leg. These types of issues are then either treated by the medical doctors uh, and or by the vascular surgeon uh, uh, team, not so much orthopedics. So just the knee replacement itself, before we get into issues now with the knee, you've got the three components. You've got the kneecap component. So the undersurface of the kneecap is replaced uh, with, a metal, with a plastic button and occasionally a metal button, but almost always plastic. The femoral component is the uh, uh, component at the end of your thigh bone. Then you've got the, the, the tibial component, which is typically a titanium plate that's placed on the top of your, of your shin bone, uh, uh, of the tibia. And then that spacer between the femur component and the tibial component is, uh, is plastic, is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, so those are really all the components of the knee. And we'll talk about how they can relate to the issues that you may have with a painful knee. So we'll talk about infection first. It is the most ominous and most difficult problem. Um, you, you would start asking the patients about, did you have a wound healing issue? Did you have drainage? Uh, did, did the wound open up at some point? Did it dehiss or something of that nature? Are you having constitutional symptoms? Or you have a fever, you just don't, you just feel kind of punk and just don't feel well. Uh, did you have some kind of laceration, uh, a wound around the knee, even a spider bite, something that may have penetrated the skin that could cause potentially an infection. 
did you have a previous history of previous healing problems with potentially other either lacerations or surgeries? Um, some people are, uh, are MRSA carriers. MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Honestly, some people just have that on their skin and oftentimes they know this because they tend to get infections. And that of course increases your chance of having um, uh, an infection with your knee replacement. And then the poor vascular health to your legs, of course, it predisposes you to skin wound issues, healing issues that may increase the chance of an infection as well. On examination, what, what are we looking for? Uh, abnormalities, or is, is it abnormally swollen? Uh, is there an abnormal effusion? The word effusion means fluid within the knee joint. So a knee replacement may stay puffy for a long time, but if you had a lot of extra fluid and the soft tissues are swollen and it's warm, you have to think about, you know, is there possibly an infection here? Obviously, if there's wound drainage or a wound healing issue, uh, that's much more uh, indicative of, of an infection. Painful range of motion can be seen. A limited range of motion can be seen. And then of course, if it's, if it's more significant, you'll actually see constitutional symptoms. To look at the potential etiologies, there's x-rays. We wanna see if uh, there are any radiolucent lines and infection oftentimes causes the knee replacement to become loose or cause the bone to be eroded, like a little cyst or a, a, a lucency in the bone. So you take routine x-rays. We get those blood tests we talked about, uh, the white blood count, the, 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 the SED rate, and then that C-reactive protein. We have another technology now that we can utilize. It's called Synovasure. It's looking for uh, an enzyme that is seen in infections. So uh, there are several centers in the country where if you draw some fluid off, we send that, I typically send mine to, to Baltimore. They do this testing and see if this enzyme is present, a very, very accurate way of seeing if there's an infection present. A bone scan can be done. Obviously that'll be positive if there's increased activity around the infection. And then of course you can always aspirate fluid and either send it for the Synovi sure I mentioned or send it to for a routine laboratory for, for blood testing. Really two types of treatment for infections. Um, there's two flavors here. One is the acute infection with, uh, with or without a, a less virulent type of bacteria. In other words, not a, a highly aggressive bacteria. So if, if, sometimes you'll see an infection soon after a knee replacement within say uh, two to six weeks. In that time frame, oftentimes you can quickly do surgery, take change the, the 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 plastic liner, clean the joint up tremendously, of course with all sorts of antibiotics and and and, and lavage cleaning systems, and then um, uh, antibiotic treatment, and you can control the infection in that way. You may need more than one irrigation debris mud procedure, depending upon how you respond uh, to the uh, to the treatment. This, of course, is done in uh, in conglomeration with an infectious disease medical specialist. So they help us with this. The more severe situation is a in chronic infection. So someone who comes in and says, well, my knee's been hurting me for months and months and months. My surgery was a year or two ago. It's not getting any better. It's constantly in pain and swollen, or they have a very virulent bacteria like, like MRSA. So that requires a more sophisticated procedure that requires what's called a two-stage procedure. First, you have to get rid of the foreign body in this situation. Just like a splinter in your hand, you're not gonna control, control the infection around your splinter until you remove the splinter. So you have to get rid of the knee replacement that's in there. So you remove the entire knee replacement. You put in a, a temporary knee replacement that is made of antibiotic uh, impregnated bone cement that then exudes antibiotics into the tissues. You get IV antibiotics oftentimes for a minimum of six weeks. Carefully work with the infectious disease specialist, carefully monitor the wound, carefully monitor the blood tests. And then ultimately, when everything's looking better, you would go back in and replant uh, the knee replacement. But that's, that's a, a long and drawn out con, uh, uh, situation. That's what is the worst situation we'll be talking about. Just a couple of images for knee replacements that are a little bit more realistic than, than the diagram of full four. Uh, the one on your left is a standard uh, um, knee replacement with the posterior cruciate ligament removed. You see that little block, if you will, behind the femoral component and that what appears to be that little white post that's going up in there. So that knee replacement's replacing both the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. The next one over to the right 
is also a primary knee replacement, but it is uh, keeping the posterior crucial ligament. So therefore there's that opening between uh, uh, on, on the femoral side that you can see, and it does require that your PCL, your posterior crucial ligament continues to work well, or your knee may feel unstable or give you issues. We'll talk a bit more about that. And then the image on your right is what we're talking about when we are, have to do a, a revision. So we've got to use a more sophisticated implant that goes farther down the tibia bone, clearly farther up the femur bone, gives much more fixation and more sophisticated uh, 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 prosthesis. It's very modular, so we can adjust that to the issue that we're dealing with. Just some more images of revision procedures. The one on the left is similar to the image you saw on the last slide. Um, the image on your right is the most uh, uh, sophisticated, and that is one where the actually the femur component and the tibia component are together, as you might be able to see in the middle there on the tibia side, there's a piece of metal going up. So there's a hinge there that's locking those two pieces together. So if you have a bad uh, situation with instability, for example, the ligaments, you can actually hinge the two uh, prostheses together and take the, any potential ligament issue out of the picture. The, the loose knee replacement, uh, of course, worsening knee pain. Sometimes there's trauma, a car accident, a fall, something happened and you've damaged that interface between the, 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 the cement, the prosthesis and the bone. Sometimes you don't have to have any injury. Sometimes the metal just uh, uh, doesn't adhere to, to the, uh, to the uh, cement. Sometimes the bone doesn't adhere to the cement. Uh, so it can happen, but there can occasionally be trauma as well. Oftentimes the patients perceive some sort of instability because as they move from side to side, obviously the loose component is shifting on the bone and causes pain. Oftentimes there's pain. You may actually, as an examining physician, be able to feel an instability. So it would, when you're stressing the ligaments, for example, you may feel that the, the component is not sitting tightly on the bone. One thing you can see on an x-ray occasionally is you can see a line where that interface has been exposed. And now you're gonna see what's called a radiolucent line or a little black line around the tissues where you should be uh, consistent and homogeneous where the, where the uh, cement was. A, a key component in the evaluation of a loose knee replacement, again, is that bone scan. If the bone scan is positive, it means there's abnormal movement and inflammation of the bone around the prosthesis. So if that prosthesis is loose, the bone scan is going to be positive and you have uh, 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 the answer regarding a loose knee replacement. Loose knee replacements typically require revision surgery with the stemmed components that we that I showed you before. Obviously, at the time of surgery, you have to carefully assess the femur component, the tibia component, and the patellar component. You look at that at surgery, you look at that at the, on the x-ray, you look at that on the bone scan, and of course, you look at it during the surgery as well. And you have everything available to treat all of those if need be. Occasionally, you could consider non-surgical treatment. The patient may say, I just don't want surgery, I can't have surgery. A brace can potentially help uh, support the loose knee replacement. Um, the unstable knee replacement, oftentimes something has happened with the ligaments or the prosthesis itself. Obviously, again, pain, a sense of instability, possibly a, a history of injury or trauma. You wanna look at what type of prosthesis was used. As I touched on a moment ago, if you have that cruciate retaining, PCL retaining prosthesis, that ligament must work. If it stretches out, the patient may say, my knee feels unstable to me. Uh, there's other prostheses where the platform rotates and sometimes that can give the patient a perception of instability. Obviously careful clinical evaluation for um, uh, instability front and back. So that's anterior to posterior and also medial to lateral. So inside, outside, and then front to back. All of those are looked at. And then you look at the prosthesis and figure out what is loose and how do you need to treat it. Then you decide with the patient, surgical versus non-surgical. Again, you could potentially say, well, it's, it's unstable. I don't want surgery. Uh, give me a brace. I'll limit my activities and go that route. If you decide for surgery, then obviously it's, it, it addresses how much instability and what is, is it from. If it's from this mid-flexion instability where the posterior crucial ligament has failed, you have to convert the patient from that uh, open femur component to the, uh, to the posterior stabilized component, the one that was on the left on those other images. Medial lateral instability, you might just be able to put in a larger polyethylene component. That may be a simple exchange of the polyethylene. 
if you end up with some sort of complex multi-directional instability where several ligaments are failed, very unstable, then you have to use the hinge prosthesis that I showed you, the rotating hinge. So here's, again, some more images to help you absorb this. The PR, the posterior cruciate retaining, has the opening in the middle. It does not have the post, so the PCL must continue to work in that setting. The CS, you've, you, you've stabilized the cruciate ligaments with the post. You do not, your ACL and your PCL have been replaced. You only have to worry about uh, the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament. The next one over, the revision, you, you've got some sort of loosening, instability, infection, so you have to go to this type of prosthesis. And then finally, if some major instability is, is present, you've got to use the hinge prosthesis on your far right. The incorrectly sized knee replacement, again, a similar presentation, pain, oftentimes poor range of motion. If the, if the knee replacement, for example, is too tight, something was incorrectly sized, the patient can't bend their knee well. If it's too small, they may perceive instability. With x-rays, careful clinical evaluation, oftentimes you can discern, is there an inappropriate size and what's going to be the fix? Sometimes a CAT scan can give you some information, um, which is a three-dimensional x-ray study to look at the bone and how is the prosthesis positioned on the bone. And then you may consider the fact that maybe the size is correct, but the position of the implant is off. Uh, oftentimes that's some sort of rotational problem. And again, that would require revision to, to change that. The incorrectly sized knee replacement, again, driven by the patient's symptoms, um, non-operative, brace, activity limitations, NSAIDs, surgical, carefully define what is the problem and make sure that there is not a, a complicating issue such as an infection, loosening, or ligament sensibility. You revise to address the specific problem that was incorrectly done before, and it may be a simple polyethylene exchange, or again, it may be more extensive all the way up to these more complicated components that I showed you. There have been a lot of advances in knee replacement revision surgery. Um, there are many choices uh, of prostheses the patients can use, uh, uh, or excuse me, can be used in the patient. There are many advanced removal equipment, uh, dedicated uh, systems where it really helps you remove the prostheses with the minimal amount of bone loss. There are specialized bone saws you can utilize to get those interfaces uh, between the prosthesis uh, and the bone. Everything's modular now, so it's, you can build it with different angles, different buildups, uh, different rotational components, all sorts of different components where you can address the patient's problem while removing the minimum amount of bone that you have to, to fix it. Uh, lastly, uh, Smith & Nephew has actually developed a robotic assisted revision surgical technique uh, in their core robotic system. So uh, you can do knee replacements with, with robots. Um, uh, you can be done for a, a regular primary total knee replacement. And um, actually, Smith & Nephew does have uh, a system now where you can use a revision surgery uh, uh, prosthesis work. Uh, I've done this uh, with the Quarry Robotic System. Uh, it is very impressive. And uh, you can kind of look originally what's there, give the computer the information in that way. Then you remove what you had to remove, including any bone that you had to remove, give that data to the robot, and it helps you decide exactly how we need to rebuild the knee. So exciting stuff uh, with robotics in a knee replacement surgery. Uh, this is an image uh, of the Smith & Nephew Quarry Robotic System. Um, the image uh, on your uh, uh, left uh, is uh, the bony resection guide. Uh, they, uh, there's a high-speed metal burr at the end. Uh, the, the little blue tabs are uh, hooked up to a, essentially a GPS system and sends information to the middle structure, the, the, the robot itself. And the fascinating thing about robotic systems is that once the robot understands what you're doing, you cannot remove more bone. So if I try to go too deep or I go to a different area that I shouldn't be removing, the robot turns the, turns the burr off and you can't remove it. So it's a wonderful interface between gathering data with the robot looking at that image that you're seeing on your right, the implant planning. So you're looking at the bone. How am I positioning it? Is it, is it correctly rotated? Is it, is it far enough up on the bone, down on the femur, sized correctly? You tell the computer exactly how to do this. The computer understands it. And then you work with the computer to resect the tissues. And, and again, this can be done uh, in the revision setting as well uh, in this particular 
uh, company system. Just getting back to a few other issues, causalgia, we touched on this before. This is a situation where the sympathetic nervous system has been reset to be too sensitive. So uh, uh, the uh, almost a situation where a non-painful stimulus, like just squeezing the skin is going to cause a lot of pain. So the body's gotten way too sensitive and the sympathetic nervous system can be involved with that. It can often be very disabling pain. Uh, oftentimes no other clear cut problem is evident and you uh, end up here almost as a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, treatment for causality is not surgical. Uh, they're non steroidal anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, medicines like gabapentin that can calm down peripheral nerves. You may get involved with the pain management um, team and possibly consider something called sympathetic nerve blocks where you're trying to block that sympathetic nervous system that has gotten too sensitive. And then Sadly, some of it is really tincture of time. Sometimes the nerves just calm down um, uh, with time. So in summary, uh, there are many possible causes to a painful knee replacement. Uh, there's a large variation between very benign things uh, like, oh, I got some patellar tendonitis to very serious issues such as uh, your knee replacement is infected or loose. It does require a methodical approach to determine the cause and the appropriate treatment. And that's a teamwork between the doctor, uh, the patient and laboratory stu uh, studies. Um, it's always what is best for the patient. How are we gonna get you to be a happy camper with your knee replacement? Doing the least we have to do, but to get you a good painful, uh, painless knee replacement. There's been significant advances in revision knee replacement surgery, and we touched on that. Um, and now we even have the robotic uh, assistance in addition to all science, uh, sorts of modular uh, components uh, and uh, removal systems that are very sophisticated as well. And that ends the discussion. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that are set forth. So the first question is, uh, how can I prepare for a knee replacement? Uh, with any knee replacement, the ideal situation is that you want to be as healthy and strong as you can be. So um, once you've decided you want, need to have a knee replacement, the things you can do are get your legs strong, get your health as good as possible with, with aerobic exercise. Um, another big component is uh, uh, your weight. If you can do anything about, if you're overweight, you can get that down. It decreases all sorts of issues. The knee sees multiples of your body weight as it moves. So as I'm gonna get out of this chair at the end of the talk, my knee is seeing 600 pounds of weight. Even I weigh about 190 pounds. So it sees a little over three times my body weight. So any degree of obesity can really increase your, your challenges when you have your knee replacement. So weight's a big issue and strength is a big issue. So those are the key factors. And of course, addressing any uh, medical problems or issues that you would uh, talk with your primary care physician about. Uh, next question is, um, I like to continue playing sports at some level, uh, pickleball, uh, should I get a knee replacement? Um, knee replacements uh, are very good in terms of getting you back to activities. Um, I've done thousands of them in my 36 years in practice. Um, I tell my patients, you can pretty much do anything you want to do. Uh, I have patients that play pickleball, that ski, that ride horses. Uh, you can do pretty much anything. However, Oftentimes, people don't feel like they can run on their knee replacement. So I, what I say to them is don't expect that you're going to be doing the flying pig. I'm not saying you can't jog across the parking lot in the rain, but you're likely not going to become a runner after your knee replacement. Not that it would hurt it, but people oftentimes don't uh, perceive that it's a comfortable thing to do. Next question is, uh, how long does the knee replacement last? Uh, tremendous advances in knee replacement technology. And it's really, what's happened is the metal and the plastic have become incredibly sophisticated. So again, I've been doing this for 36 years. When I started, they lasted about 10 years. Now, uh, the knee replacements I did earlier today are FDA approved for 30 plus years. So incredible uh, advances in the metal. They have basically been able to ceramicize steel. So getting the, the, the smoothness of ceramic but the rigidity and the strength of steel, and then the plastic technology, the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, 
has really, really, really become sophisticated. And now we're up in this, you know, uh, 20 minimum, uh, 30, no problem in terms of years of lasting of a knee replacement. Uh, next question is, uh, I'm nervous about a second knee replacement. Can I try something less invasive? Yes, you know, a knee replacement is always your decision. In other words, there's, there's no scenario where I'm gonna say to you, you have, you know, you have to have this done. It's not like we found cancer. It's not like some horrible thing has happened. So there's always options and there are many, that's a totally different talk, but all sorts of uh, medicines, injections, uh, the gel shots you may be familiar with, braces, activity alterations, all sorts of things that can be done. And only when you decide that you want to have it done is when you press the button and say, hey, doc, I'm ready. Let, let's do it. Next question is, what is uh, PRP? Can it help? Uh, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Um, platelet-rich plasma is very, very effective um, for soft tissues. So it's a great thing uh, to utilize if you have some sort of tendonitis problem. So it's, it's, it's extremely effective, for example, Achilles tendonitis, uh, tennis elbow, uh, patellar tendonitis, but PRP is not going to put the cartilage back in your knee. So it's not really effective uh, uh, for an arthritic knee. It's not going to put that cartilage back on. So a great medicine, a, a great treatment, for soft tissue and basically tendon issues, but not for bone pathology. How common is knee revision is the next question. Uh, it's probably about two or 3%. So it doesn't happen often. Um, the, the big drivers are, are, are infection um, uh, and loosening, uh, but it's not, you know, it overall are a very, very, very successful surgery. Uh, probably about 94, 95% successful. So a couple of those percentage are obviously a surgical treatment. The other uh, non-successful patients have some sort of other issue, causalgia uh, uh, or some other medical problem uh, that their knee replacement is perceived not to work for them. Next question is, um, how long is the recovery process? Uh, when can I start walking? Um, well, knee replacements now are uh, outpatient is outpatient surgery. About 85% of the folks I do are outpatient. Um, you are walking an hour after the surgery. So the typical scenario is we do it at eight o'clock. We're done at nine o'clock. By 10 o'clock, you're up walking to the potty. You're going home at noon. So it's very fast in terms of getting up and moving on right away. Knee replacements are rock solid in the recovery room. So you can put full weight on them. So their weight bearing is tolerated. However, that said, you do need to recover. You've got a, you know, you still have a, a, a significant operation to your knee, and it typically takes a couple of months to get over that. So you've got to work with your physical therapist. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to do your exercises, and you know it takes a couple of months to get where you want to be. But um, the, the early recovery now is very, very rapid, and you can be functional extremely quickly after knee replacement. Uh, next question is: um, What factors increase the likelihood? Of, uh, of knee revision. Uh, complicated question. Uh, we kind of touched on it here. Uh, the big things that you worry about are uh, uh, obesity would be a major issue because the forces are so great on the knee. Some sort of uh, uh, poor vascular integrity, uh, previous uh, infection history. Uh, those are really the big issues. Uh, again, revisions aren't likely uh, and oftentimes they can't be helped. You know, if you get an infection, it's not your fault. It's not the doctor's fault. It just happens. It's like getting a blood clot. But, um, you know, you, you have to kind of load the deck in your favor with the things we talked about before in terms of getting ready for the surgery in all the right ways. And we do things now, for example, that every patient that we do surgery on, uh, they take showers with, the, with surgical soap for days before the surgery. They put an ointment in their nose um, uh, to help kill bacteria. So we're trying to drive those bacteria risks to, uh, down uh, to an absolute minimum, of course, decreasing the chance of getting an infection. Uh, next question is, um, what are some of the common reasons why I wouldn't be a candidate for knee revision? There aren't very many can candidates for knee revision in and of itself. So I, it's hard for me to sit here and say, well, you have a knee replacement, it's painful, um, and we can't do anything about it. 
that almost would never happen. So it's either going to be some non-orthopedic issue, in which case we, we move you to the right doctor, for example, a vascular injury uh, uh, or issue, uh, a low back issue where we have you see the, our, our low back people. If it's a knee revision itself that has to be done, again, you, you have to carefully define what the problem is. Is it loose? Is it infected? Is it incorrectly sized? And then you address that problem. So there really aren't a whole lot of reasons why we couldn't fix it. Um, next question is uh, what gender increases the chances of needing a, a revision? There's really no significant gender component. So uh, it, it's uh, not significant, honestly. Um, does a revision basically take longer uh, to recover from compared to the original implant? Interestingly, uh, I, I, perhaps a little bit, but you realize that when you do the revision, you are going to remove the old component, fix the problem, and then put the new component in. So it's a little bit slower, but you're on that same course. It's still full weight bearing. Um, it is still uh, 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 oftentimes outpatient surgery or maybe just one night in, in the hospital. Um, so it's going to take longer, but it's not dramatically different. Next question is, uh, are there any alternatives to knee revision? It depends upon uh, what, uh, why you need a revision. So almost always there are choices. I've even had patients um, who have infections and they decide um, that, you know, I just, I just can't go through the operation. Uh, and then we have the infectious disease people perhaps try a suppressive antibiotic therapy or something like that. So there are choices, but you have to decide what the problem is and can I live with, uh, with the, the, the reason as to why I'm contemplating a revision uh, or can I brace it, use medicines, et cetera. Uh, next question is, I feel on my knee that was, that was replaced. And from, and from that point on, it has continued to hurt nonstop. What should be, what should be done? I'm sorry, does that mean you fell on your knee replacement? Um, if you fell on it and it's hurting you since then, you need to get evaluated. So, you know, either A, let's hope that you have a tendonitis, you know, you, you bruised your patellar tendon and could be treated with some medicines and physical therapy. But as I touched on before, you may have loosened your prosthesis. Um, you may have a major ligament injury. So it needs to get evaluated and, and looked at. Um, Next question, uh, what about pain caused by a recalled knee that has failed? Who is responsible for informing the patient of a recall? Um, somewhat of a legal question. Um, frankly, in, in, in my practice, if uh, I fortunately have not had any uh, knees that have been recalled, but that really falls on, on the responsibility of your physician uh, to say, you know, th there has been a recall of your knee. Um, and there's been an issue with it, and you need to discuss that with your with your doctor. Um, next question is: I'm allergic to NSAIDs, and my IT band is inflamed. What are the treatment options? Well, yeah, you know, if you can't take NSAIDs, many many people can't so often anymore because of the blood thinners and other issues with GI problems. You're left with the most conservative would be try some like some Voltaren gel or Icy Hot something like that. Uh, the next option would be to come in and, and, and see us. Uh, you can get physical therapy. Uh, you can get an injection to the iliotibial band. And there's a, lots of stretches and home exercises you can do to help with that problem, whether you have any replacement or not, to be honest with you. And I don't see any further questions. So uh, if we don't see any other questions pop up, uh, I think uh, this is the completion uh, of our discussion. Thank you very much.